learn about the strides female entrepreneurs of color are making. Be inspired by their story and enlightened by their leadership, insight, and advice. Welcome to Win Hers United. This is Season 7, Episode 8, entitled Take Time to Make Change with Rhodesia Ransom. I'm your host, Nicole Walker, and I believe that business, mindset, personal development, and self-care are the four pillars to entrepreneurial success. This is why When Hers United is your one-stop shop for business, mindset, personal development, and self-care conversations with winning women of color entrepreneurs. Before you get into this episode, can you please do me a favor? I need you to go to Apple Podcasts right now. Scroll to the bottom of your Win Hers United feed. Give us a five-star rating. All you have to do is click the five stars. And most importantly, write us a review. It shouldn't take more than five minutes of your life, and it would be a priceless gift to me. I'm hoping I can count on you to do this, and I'm thanking you in advance for doing so. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Rhodesia Ransom, who is a justice leader, speaker, Tracy City Council member, and the CEO of Sow a Seed Foundation. One of Rhodesia's guiding beliefs is that community-focused leadership must be principled, collaborative, and results-oriented. Rhodesia is truly focused on solving the problems that are faced by the community and the youth, which she has been doing actively since her childhood. Rhodesia has held numerous board, community, and school positions in her efforts to affect positive change. And she's received numerous awards for her work, such as the Freedom Fighter Award, the Martin Luther King Jr. Image Award, and the Grassroots Activist of the Year Award. During this episode, Rhodesia talks to us about how to affect local change that matters to our everyday lives, why running for local office is important, the importance of mentorship, and much, much, much more. So without further ado, here is Take Time to Make Change with Rhodesia Ransom. All right, so Rhodesia, welcome. We appreciate you joining us today, and we're excited to learn more about you and your journey. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. You're welcome. All right, so let's get started by you telling us about your background and what you currently do professionally. Well, that's a, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so my background, I was born and raised in San Francisco, and I grew up, my grandmother was a missionary, and so when you grow up and your grandmother's a missionary and you, you can expect that you are always going to church, always in the community, community activities, whether it was a Sunday or whether you were out there for weekday things, that's all I knew was, you know, being in the community, working with my grandmother, and then growing up in San Francisco, there was always, you know, culture and art and diversity and a lot of things happening there, so that's kind of my entrance into what I do now, which is pretty much about public service. I'm a nonprofit executive director for an organization called Sow a Seed Community Foundation. We provide mental health and mentoring opportunities for young people. And in this age of social, social justice, the work we do is very important because we have really been helping our young people find their voice and advocate for themselves, especially the young men who have been, and women who have been previously incarcerated in our juvenile justice system, or who have been in out-of-home placement, whether it be foster care, or, you know, just living away from their families. And in addition to that daily work, I'm also an elected city council member for the city of Tracy, California, mm -hmm. where I am one of five people charged with managing the city budget and directing our city attorney and city manager in regards to things that improve people's quality of life, whether it be making sure that we have enough opportunities for parks and recreation, or whether it be making sure that we're building a community that will actually give people an opportunity to 
work and live in the same city and not have to spend four hours per day commuting. Mm. So those are a couple of the roles that I have. I also serve on a couple of boards, but for what do I do? It's a loaded question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a short loaded answer, but that's, that's pretty much what I do in my day to day right now. Okay. Thanks for that. Before I go into the next scripted question, right? You just made me think of something to talk about with the listeners, right? I feel like a lot of change that directly affects people happens on the council level, but people don't really realize that or understand that. They think more presidency, but as far as what impacts you on a day-to-day -day basis, can you just talk about that briefly? Oh, very much so. That is so important. And I, t I tell people all the time, you know, people are really looking to make changes right now. And I said, you know, we focus on the president, but the, the changes and the things that you feel every day in your everyday lives, the traffic you feel, the potholes you feel, the lack of jobs, those are people at very low levels, such as city council members. Those are school board members that are really making the decisions for how your children will be educated and you know, what, how the money will be spent, what kind of textbooks will be purchased. So those low level things really matter. And something that I think a lot of people neglect is the judges. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go down their ballot and they're just like, I don't know any of these people. And they just check a box when it comes to judges because judges don't really have to do a lot of public running. And a lot of times judges are unopposed on the ballot. So you really, you got to pay attention to more than just the president. Those things that really impact our daily lives are normally lower on the ballot. Okay. Now, when you, you just said unopposed on the ballot, what does that mean? That means nobody even ran against them. That means there was one mm -hmm. name, you had one choice, and it's probably the person who's been there forever, or sometimes the judges get appointed, and then nobody ever challenges them. So we really need people who are going to hold elected people accountable by challenging them in elections and by us actually doing our homework so that they know they have to work for our votes. Yes. Oh, that's a great point. I know I was a part of a organization that was looking to make change in the community back when I lived in New Jersey. And one thing that they brought up that really stuck out to me was that it wasn't a lot of people even coming to the meetings to place their votes. Like people were getting placed in by like three votes or, you know, for lack yep. of a better number. Yep. That that also happens, you're right, in uh, organizations in the community. There's the election portion of being in the community, but then there's also, you know, this movement you've been probably hearing about lately about getting people on boards and, and community foundations because those organizations are making decisions about who gets what in the community. And we got to show up to vote for those things. We do. And you, I get this little thing in the mail where I live, there's also a smaller water district, people who make decisions about, you know, water and mm -hmm. how things are going to be happening, how the, the usage will happen. And it's like a little tiny board and nobody votes in that because nobody even knows who those people are, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to not take things for granted and go, oh, okay, this is not important because a lot of times things are important. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. So <laughs> tell us about how you got into this area. Yeah, so for me, it was really interesting with women. You often hear that, you know, women do not normally jump into this arena unless someone asks them to do it. And that's kind of what happened to me. Part of my background has been serving on boards and commissions. I served as a planning commissioner, which a lot of people should get involved in commissions as well, making mm -hmm. uh, big decisions about how the city general plan, which is like our 30 year kind of plan for, it's like having a business plan for your city. Mm. So I served on that for seven years, really making decisions about land use and housing development and what the community character would look like and whether we would be giving some exemptions for certain types of companies and th things like that. And then I got a chance to serve on what's called a civil grand jury. And San Joaquin County Civil Grand Jury, what they do is they take complaints about you know abuse and uh, misconduct and malfeasance and corruption in government. And so I served on there. Um, I was the vice four person and served there for a few years, a couple of years, actually. And it, it was an eye opener into like, not so much dysfunction. There was definitely dysfunction in some areas, but really the responsibilities and the fact that 
there was a lot of like nepotism in some different some city departments where you know you have the brothers and the uncles and the different family members mm-hmm. um holding seats uh, uh you know for the community and people using city things for their personal budgets mm-hmm. filling up filling up their personal cars at at you know the bus station gas station and <laughs> you know so I got involved in that and so when someone approached me and said, hey, you know, this is years ago, you should run for office, you should run for the Board of Supervisors. At the time, I was teaching college at public finance and public policy. My passion is really like community and how you make it work right, right? So I was kind of going, well, you know what, let me try to, all these theories that we're teaching students about, you know, how things work and unintended consequences. All right, let me put my money where my mouth is. I don't mind, I'll run because it was really important to understand that like all the the decisions that are being made at the county board of supervisors are about things that really touch our lives Mm -hmm. Uh, mental health care is at the county board of supervisors welfare is at the county board of supervisors public health which you know if you're in a coronavirus pandemic Mm -hmm. the public health officer is making the decisions on whether you're going to be open whether you're going to be closed whether you're going to have masks you know those things so many things that happen in our community that i care about were attached to being an elected office at the same time you don't do that kind of work for pay and i was already serving as the executive director i'm actually a co-founder for sow a seed the work that we do we are involved in schools throughout the county as well as we have a small center where people students come after school i got to keep that work and continue to weigh in on you know mentoring and mental health and opportunities for young people and their families and still get a chance to make real valuable decisions. So for me, it was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so. Nice. Yeah, it sounds like you're busy, 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 right? <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I was telling someone yesterday, busy is different when you like what you do versus when you don't like what you do. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's, you know, a challenge. Like, oh, I can't wait to see, you know, the outcome versus go into a job you really don't want to be at that you really you know never intended to be in I feel like my busy is fun yes I like that that's a good point too because I always say it's better to be productive than busy so yes productive right all right so tell us what you wanted to be when you grew up Mm. (laughs) that's so funny so I got my my first degree in political science because I thought you know what I want to be a lawyer I want to go in the courtroom and like to argue with people and do all of these different things. I mean, at one point I wanted to be a, an airline pilot. I was like, I'm going to go to Air Force and, and be a, an airline pilot. Then I realized I don't really like flying that much. And, <laughs> and then you probably needed to have perfect vision. I don't have my glasses on now. But I, <laughs> so I stuck with lawyer. And then my senior year of college, we had to do an internship where you actually go in and you sit with lawyers every couple of weeks for this whole semester I was with different lawyers and all I saw them do was paperwork and I said I don't want to do that (laughs) I feel like college is a little backwards right that you make you take this important internship at the very end of of college so at that point I decided I don't want to be a lawyer I just want to be able to help people in the community and, and do good work in regards to helping people and that's how I found myself in the nonprofit route Okay, good, good. You made a very good point, though, like actually shadowing or getting a closer look at what we think we want. Because sometimes you got to yes. know um, one of my family members, she wanted to be a nurse. And so her grandmother got sick and she actually had to take care of her grandmother. And she was like, scrap that. I don't want to be a nurse anymore. Right. So, <laughs> you know, it might sound grandiose, but really know what you're getting into to save yourself the pain of not liking it once you're already mm-hmm. in it. Right. Yes. I, I was spared. I was just like, wait, you guys have to do all this paperwork? You don't just go to the courtroom and let the assistants do the paperwork? Oh, no, I'm not. I don't. I still ended up with a job where you do a lot of paperwork, but it's, just, <laughs> it's different, you know. But yeah, that's so important. And that's why like mentorship and, and really getting people to mentor you, you know, and, and show you the way and show you some examples. And you find out that you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you may make changes. Okay. Thanks for that. 
All right. So you talked about spending a lot of your childhood in church and helping the community. Do you want to elaborate on your upbringing as a child? Yeah, we can. It's really funny because in the the roles that I serve, people, you know, they just kind of assume like, oh, you you probably had to pull yourself up from bootstraps, you know, whatever. And I will, I have to be honest and say, you know, I grew up very comfortable as a child. I went to private school my entire life, went to Catholic school. And then my grandmother was a missionary, a Pentecostal missionary. And so kind of a little, little different, a lot of difference. But, you know, I got to travel every year with her when she did things domestically and when she did foreign missions and things like that, I couldn't go. But I got to spend a lot of time really just learn to enjoy things like helping connect people who needed things to those things. And sometimes it would be as simple as handing out government food right? You know, you have those big blocks of cheese and you got people lined up for blocks and you're passing out cheese and butter and and things like that. But you got to find out that a lot of people who, even people you knew, they looked like everything was okay, but it really wasn't because they really needed help. And so I had a, a sheltered life. Like I never went to a slumber party until I was 23 years old. I never slept away from home. I joined a sorority in college and that was like my first slumber party. I feel like today, where I am today, I can kind of look back on so many different lessons and things that really make me attractive to the things that I do right now. Okay, thanks for that. So you were raised by your grandmother? Well, I was raised by my mother and my grandmother. My mother had a business and so she worked a lot. And so after school, I'd go straight to my grandmother's house or even to an aunt's house. Everyone lived in the same neighborhood. I grew up in San Francisco in a neighborhood called Bayview Hunters Point. And so there were really good examples. And then there were other examples. I think that's part of the reason why they had me in private school is because, you know, the neighborhood that we grew up in, there were a lot of different kinds of things that you could get involved in that I probably would not be who I am today or where I am today had I gotten involved in some of those other things. So. I remember making a conscious decision like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to do that. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. So tell us about a pivotal point in your life and how it shaped who you are today. That is a good question. You should have gave me a heads up, a pivotal point in my (laughs) life. You know what? It actually came my first run for office because I've always worked in the community and you, when you're in the community, especially as a nonprofit director, everyone loves you. Everyone wants to work with you, you know? And then when I first decided, yes, I'm going to take a step in and run for office and get involved. It was really interesting that people that had good relationships were like, no, it's not your time. We, you're not going to do this. We have somebody already who's going to do that. And, and then, you know, politically people, start making up stories about you. And I'm like, wait, y'all know I didn't do nothing like that. You know, it was just, it was hurtful. It was very eye-opening that, you know, people will be with you until they can't tell you, you know, make those decisions for you. They will support you. But when you don't have their permission and you find that you don't need their permission to do things, then suddenly it's a game changer. And so I kind of went, I don't want to say I was naive, but I grew up, you know, being told and, and challenging myself that if you work hard, you will get everything that you're supposed to get. Just do your homework, be smart, work hard. And I actually, I, I will be honest with you, that is kind of like uh, a revelation that I had with my own kids. That Like that's a lesson that we need to be really careful with how we teach those lessons. Because yes, if you work hard and you're smart, it will get you places, but sometimes it will be people standing there to say, I don't care how smart you are or how hard you work, we make the rules and, and we don't want you to do these things. And whether you're trying to go to college or, you know, different things that you're trying to do. So those lessons, those eye-opening lessons for me started in 2012, the very first time that I put my name on a ballot. And I'm just like, whoa, you know, I didn't know you had that mean streak, <laughs> you know, so. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. And I think especially for people of color, I didn't like the, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? Because I've always been a, I want my work to speak for itself. I don't want to have to suck up to anyone to be recognized, right? I just want to put my best foot forward and that should be able to guide me. 
but unfortunately in the world we live it's not always that case so i do i do understand that and agree it's unfortunate yeah it is unfortunate and that's exactly how i was raised and it's how i raised my kids that it's like if you work hard and you get smart, you, you're smart, you do your homework, eventually you will get where you're going. And then I had this epiphany and I realized when we talk about systems right now, there's a lot of conversations about systemic injustice and systems. And then I'm telling my kids, I'm like, these systems that were built to fail African-Americans going way back, you know, Jim Crow, then, you know, black codes, all these different things, even though those people are not here, and even though there's been all kinds of civil rights movements that have, you know, I want to do air quotes, that have changed, you know, the laws on the books, those systems persist, and we have people who are unknowingly even participating in some of the setups <laughs> that those systems had in place. That's why running for office and being elected is so impart important, not to just have a person who looks like me there, but a person who can actually go in and make sure that we are making it so that when people do work hard and they are smart and they are making changes that we're giving them the opportunities that they deserve and that will benefit the community. So those are lessons that I wish I had learned a lot younger in life, long time ago. I feel like all of us would have less disappointment. I remember my middle child, she knew she wanted to be a doctor from like fourth grade. And so she graduated high school with a 4.25 grade point average, had went through all these AP programs, and her thing was she was going to go to an Ivy League. She had this thing in her mind, going to this Ivy League school, Princeton, was her top choice. And when she didn't get into Princeton, even though she had all these great choices, it was like, but I did this, I did that, and I have the GPA, I have the, you know, I have the SAT, and, you know, and it's just like, well, we don't make the rules, we don't get to pick. <laughs> So, and just seeing her be so devastated for so long about like all the work that she did for that thing. She did the research on like who their average admitted student was and, you know, she tailored her life for that school and then did not get in. So that was just like a huge, like for me, I'm like, oh God, as parents, we have to be careful telling our kids do the work and you'll get the prize because it's not always true. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so tell us what you're currently doing to improve yourself personally and or professionally. <sighs> Gosh, okay, so what am I doing to improve myself? I try to find hobbies. You Normally my self-care is karaoke, but currently in this environment, we cannot go do karaoke. So I am stuck being my regular self. I can't go out there and pretend to be some, you know, chart top and singer and so uh right now i just you know check in with family friends and that's kind of been what i do but to improve myself i do a lot of audible books and homework on you know just kind of understanding some things and so yesterday just yesterday actually i challenged a group of friends you know let's let's start reading some books let's read books together and, and have some discussions so that is a really tough question because I'm really, I'm good at like self-help and going to read a lot of self-help books, but I really feel like part of improving yourself is taking care of yourself. It's not about just, you know, trying to get all the knowledge and read all the books and know what all the latest gurus have to say. Self-care is something that I'm really trying to be more mindful of because right now I think we all need a little more self-care. Mm, I agree. Thanks for bringing that up, right? Yeah, because we are multifaceted, right? And we need to yeah. tend to all those different areas. So that's a great point. I love the karaoke, though. Hopefully, <laughs> soon, or maybe you and your friends can get together and do like a Zoom. I know you're over Zoom, but, you know, so karaoke Zoom, right? We got to figure out new yes. ways to make things happen, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> we, thought, we thought about that. Hey, hey, it's Nicole. I'm jumping in to remind you that using your voice for good is a great way to affect positive change in the world. And podcasting is a great way to allow your voice and your message to reach the masses. If you're interested in podcasting, then we need to talk. Schedule a podcast launch consultation with me so we can get you on your way. Check the show notes for today's episode at winhersunited.com forward slash podcast and use the link bit.ly 
forward slash win hers dash pod call. And that's with a capital W, a capital H, a capital P, and a capital C to get on my calendar right away. I can't wait to help you out. All right. So tell us about your morning routine. What does your morning look like? Mm, my morning routine. So I have two morning routines. So my most productive days are when I follow the routine that I should, which is when your alarm goes off, you get up, you check your to-do list. I like to read, like I have these Bible apps on my phone and they'll kind of lead me through different lessons that you, you can read. And then I have this, this journal. Those are the, the best days. And I start most of my days like that because with the things that I do and the things that I go through, I need a lot of spiritual preparation. So that's how I prefer to start my days. And then on a bad day, I'll go to read the Bible app and a Facebook notification will pop up and then I'll get lost <laughs> and have to and have to find my way back to, okay, what am I supposed to do today? But really, um, I wake up and I, I, I find a few minutes to myself to try to get centered and get ready to have a productive day. And I think that that makes my days more productive. Okay, thanks for that. Yes, I like that. What apps do you use? I use the Bible Gateway app. Um, That's my number one app. And then there's a Dr. Charles Stanley, who's, I don't know how many decades he's been um, doing, you know, ministry and Bible study. So I get his like daily devotion. And then sometimes it's 30 minutes that he has that you can listen to. So I'm I'm on intouch.org and then the Bible uh, Gateway app. Okay. And then in Bible Gateway, you can actually follow different plans. And if there's a certain thing you want to focus on, maybe you want to focus on, you know, relationships you can do a plan for that and they're really short like you can do them in five ten minutes every morning okay thanks for sharing and you made a good point too about the facebook notifications right like i feel like distractions are real right you have to be aware of them though right because i mean it happens but as long as you you know like make yourself aware right like okay i got distracted like you can begin to bring yourself back right Yes. I, you know what I started doing when I realized I was getting distracted? I'm like, I'll tell myself, okay, you got 10 more minutes on this thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got 10 minutes to be nosy, to see what people are eating, to see, you know, what they're griping about today. Um, but there's also times that you there's news that either with my position, I, I'll put things out there, you know, regarding what's happening in public health or catch up on some things. But those distractions are very real. And so you have to be mindful and say, you know what? Five minutes and I'm done. (laughs) Okay. Good tip. I like that. All right. So you talked about the different books and self-help and things like that. Like, tell us about the last book that you read or listened to. Right now, I just, we just purchased a book called Just Mercy. So I'm going to be starting that a group of people and I, we're going to be reading Just Mercy um, because I've had a lot of people say, you know, what can we read to be more educated about, you know, kind of some of the systemic injustice in the country. So Just Mercy is a book that we're reading. And then I have an Audible app and I follow John Maxwell. So John Maxwell, his leadership books are really good to listen to because you'll get those lessons and you're like, you know what, I can use that today. 21 Steps to Leadership is a book that I listen to because you can listen to it and then you're like, you know, let me go back to that step and, and catch back up because I need that step in my life. And, and so I listen to a lot of different leadership books on Audible. And then the books that are more stories, I like to actually turn the pages of those books. Okay, I like that. I like that different flavor for what you're looking for. I also yeah. like John Maxwell has a minute with Maxwell emails, right? For people who yes. your attention span is short, your time is limited. You know, we all have a minute, right, to kind of get yeah. a nugget to, to carry us forth, so. Yep. All right. Do you practice personal affirmations? I don't. I don't. I should. Every now and then, I'll, I'll have to give myself a positive self-talk mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know, with the work that I do, you're moving so fast, and there's so many things that are just not uplifting around you that I'll, I'll find myself giving me, myself a positive self-talk, but I don't really do affirmations okay. like I should. Do you have one that you recommend? Oh like my a, goodness, you done turned the page. Well, <laughs> 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 so funny, lately, because I'm coming from a place of 
healing my self-worth and my self-esteem, right? So mm -hmm. mine is currently, I do good, I am good, I deserve good, right? Mm -hmm. And just continuing to tell myself that because I can be hard on myself, right? I'm always yeah. looking towards the next mark, right? Right. And yeah, so that's been my latest and greatest. Yeah, that that's really good. So I don't change them up, but when I find myself, you know, kind of, a lot going on i remind myself you know what you're strong and you're worthy you can handle this and, and you know just keep pushing forward but i have friends who you go and they have affirmations everywhere the, the post-it notes everywhere i've not done that i've not gotten there yet i should probably try it though okay well i like yours too though you know whatever <laughs> works right you know and yeah. you made a good point though because it does for me change over time right so right you know, right now, maybe you won't. In the future, maybe you will, you know. Yeah. So. All right. So tell us about your toughest struggle and how you overcame. My toughest struggle and how I overcame that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's such a good question. Wow. I've had a lot of different struggles from, you know, just trying to be a parent, you know, be a mom. and and then also balance the things that I want to do and just realize that, you know, feeling like there's not enough hours in a day. I've not had like this tremendously hard life. You know, a lot of people, like, you know, they have these stories. My stories are just like, how do I live my day-to-day -day life in a way that is productive and making sure that as a parent, that my children feel valued, that my husband doesn't feel neglected and really trying to be myself, which is I'm a very active, engaged member of the community just naturally. And then, you know, knowing that sometimes your family doesn't want to be part of all of that and, mm -hmm. and trying to say, okay, well, you guys, don't, don't you want to come with me to this thing? And they're like, no, we don't want to go. <laughs> so you're making those tough choices about, you know, how do you balance being an active member of the community, still being a wife and, and making sure that your husband and your children feel like they are validated and important and a priority and so at one point I had to just say you know what let me make sure that they know that they're first and then you know everything else will just fall in line and I think that 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 has worked especially since they are also busy as well but it was really tough trying to make decisions on you know all of these different community engagements and things to be involved in and things that I naturally wanted to be involved in and it's like, wait, but dinner's right. Y'all just eat, I'm leaving, right? So <laughs> trying to balance that, especially in this day and age where young people are like struggling with mental health and isolation and not feeling like they have adults that they can talk to. I needed to make sure that I could at least be there for my family to talk to. So honestly, I went through a point where I was just trying to, I really spent over a year trying to figure out like, well, maybe I should cut back on all my other stuff and just, you know, I'm not the stay at home wife type of person, but you know, I, I really did try to, to figure out how to balance everything. Okay. Thanks for that. As I was listening to you, I was thinking balance and then you said balance, right? And I think that that's an issue. A lot of women, even women listening can relate to, right? It's like, okay, we want to be super mom and super wife, right? But we also don't want to neglect ourselves because then we can yeah. resent, you know, yeah. being super mom and super yeah. wife. It's like, well, what about me? What about the other stuff yeah. that I like to do? Like, yeah, I love you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, but I also feel like I have other things to complete or to other ways to serve the world, right? So, yes. and you brought up a, wow, a year. To try to it took me it out. took me a minute because I got really busy and then you have people pulling you in the directions. I need to introduce you to this person. You have to be at this thing and you know, running an organization, you have to network a lot because I have to raise money to make sure that our 14 staff members have jobs and that we can actually do our mission and things like that. And I really do like the work that I do. And I'm like, I'm like, but don't you guys want to come? I I figured I think the mistake that I made was thinking that just because it was my passion and they were my family, that they would be willing to go along for this whole ride. And they're like, we're there for part of your ride, but we're not there for all of it. We have our own lives and, you know, letting them have space to have their own lives and then, you know, making sure that I prioritized 
everything was, I had to like work on that. Okay. I like that. It reminds me of the big rocks, right? Like our rocks, whether they're the big ones, put those in first and let the other ones fall where mm-hmm. they may, right? Okay. Yes. All right. So tell us about an aha moment that you had lately and how you've changed as a result. Hmm. An aha moment. Oh gosh. I've been such an, an evolution for the last <laughs> five years. It's just kind of like slowly evolving, but I've not had any major aha. I just feel like, you know, I got baptized by fire when I got into politics. And and I think the biggest lesson that is coming to roost now is that people like will make decisions that are not even healthy for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, just to be in opposition, you know, politically, to be in political opposition, they'll make decisions that are just harmful to themselves. And so my job I've learned is to try to get them to see where we can relate. Like, let's find out what we can actually agree on. Okay, so you don't like that, you know, I voted for X, Y, and Z, or you just don't like that, I wasn't your person of choice. I totally get that. But how do we actually, I think what I've been coming to grips with is, okay, how do I get these people to understand I am not your enemy because I don't have time to be anybody's enemy, but we can agree to disagree. But when it comes to life, health, safety, things like that, we're going to have to figure out where we can come together because that is, it's just unfortunately in the roles that I play, people will literally physically, mentally, emotionally put themselves in bad, you know, even economic uh, positions because of, you know, their political stances. And sometimes your political stance is not the best for your personal situation. So I've really been struggling with, you know, how to let people know, like, I'm safe. I'm just, don't worry about me. Let's, let's try to work together and figure out how we can help everybody. Hmm. It's also kind of the aha moment uh, in nonprofit world. You know, in the nonprofit world, you think it's all about collaborating for this community thing. And there was a time that I realized like, oh, wait, we're actually, you're actually competing. Like, Mm. we're supposed to be working together. You're competing with me and competing with our organization. And so I realized that in the arenas that I am that are all about service, and you would think everybody in these arenas and in these positions are all about what can we do to make things happen for the best. I've realized that I sometimes have to go in there and break the ice and build a collaboration and let people know I'm not here to hurt you or harm you or force my position on you. So that has definitely been, um, has been a work in progress. And it's a work in progress that's not just about me. I can't control how other people feel. That's probably the biggest aha is mm-hmm. I can't control other people's feelings or actions not even my actions can't even control how they feel about me. So (laughs) Mm -hmm. that's terrible. I agree with that. I like that. And I feel like, like you talked about in the political arena as well as nonprofit, but I feel like that can be related to many parts of life. Like as I was listening to you, it made me think of dealing with my daughter sometimes. Like sometimes I feel like some of her decisions may just be to oppose Right, what I'm saying. <laughs> it wants right? to spite you. It wants to spite you Possibly. so bad. You know, no shade. I love my child. You know, but I mean, even thinking of how I was at that age, right? Like, yeah. you know, sometimes we just want to go against the grain, even if the grain is the greatest thing, and we'll shoot yes. off our nose to spite our face, right? And it's like, why? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point, you know. And I can relate to your feelings as far as expecting one thing and realizing it was another in relation to nonprofit. Yeah. Right? I think that I experienced that coming into women empowerment and things like that, where it's like everyone that shouts women empowerment doesn't really eat, sleep and believe in it. Right. So I love your advice though. Like I just put my best foot forward and let a person know, like, look, I'm really about it. You know, yeah. I can't help, you know, whoever you may have met, or I can't help the fact that maybe you're not really about it, but I yeah. am, right? And, and don't the, allow that to change who you are. The, the, the women empowerment piece, we can talk about that for hours. That as a woman, that is so hurtful it to is. go and seek, you know, 
especially from another woman who has achieved more, a woman that you admire and, and you go and they look at you as a competition or, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot. And so you're absolutely right. When we say we're going to be empowering other people and we're going to lift other people up, we really should be about it. And even me, you know, I'm, I'm really busy. Sometimes I have to do a gut check because I'll be putting people off because I'm busy. And I'm like, you know what? Let me be who I say I am and let me make time for these people. You know, let me help them. So. Mm, good point. Good point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I like, I like what you said too, right? Because I found myself a few times looking up to people and then something happened that shade, like it was shade, right? And I accepted <laughs> the shade. But then too, it was like, I learned to look at it a different way. I said, oh, well, I must got some stuff going on because sometimes yes. we can overlook our greatness, right? So that was just like, wow, I'm looking up to you, but obviously you're letting me know, you know, mm -hmm. how great I obviously am, right? That was my <laughs> own way of making myself feel better, right? But <laughs> <laughs> like, what? we have to stop. We have to stop doing that, ladies. And I hope, you know, none of our listeners do that, right? But yeah. it's not you if that's what you experience. Yeah, Nicole, that is so real. It is this it's not about us and it's just like, you know, you're looking up to someone and they have their own struggles that you just didn't know about. We only see the outside. We don't know what they're going through. And I think oftentimes we don't realize that we're doing better than we think we are. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, true. All right. So tell us about a resource that you use and how you utilize it. So because I work with social workers, like I love social workers. <laughs> I really do. I feel like, you know, I started using them in my daily work in the nonprofit, but now I bring them into matters of policy and politics because they understand how people and environments are supposed to work together. And so I find myself, you know, really leaning on other, you know, social work friends and and I also belong to a couple of women's groups. And I really, I think everybody should have a support group that they can lean on, an intentional mm -hmm. support group, a group of, of people who will tell you the truth when you're wrong and call you out when you're not doing it right, but that'll also uplift you. So I have a really close-knit band of, band of women and uh, we normally would go out and every couple of weeks and get together, but it's important to have that as a network and as a resource, professionally in all arenas, I really rely on my, my my social work crew because they will tell me like, well, that policy sounds good, but, you know, and give me kind of a different way to think about it. And it just really has helped me up, up my level of thinking about how we navigate things in the community and life, because that's where I spend a lot of my time. Okay. Thanks for that. I love that, right? Because I feel like a lot of leaders they don't look to the people that's actually on the playing field, right? Like mm -hmm. you look to, you know, people that don't even necessarily know the struggles of the people that are directly impacted. So that's a great leadership trait to go directly to the source or the people as close to the source as you can get, right? Absolutely. And honestly, the most successes that I've had are people, they look at me and they're like, oh, wow, you pulled that off. It really wasn't me. It was me acknowledging that I didn't know everything that I needed to get that thing achieved and going to get the other people. So I worked on a, this homelessness issue here in our community. I'm not a homelessness expert. So I went and got together with those other people, but I was willing to support them and empower them in ways that they did not have that support so that we can actually get something accomplished. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of my, my daughters, my youngest daughter, and I'll talk about her she always says, it's not about you, mom. It's not about you, <laughs> right? Because we'll be talking about something and I'll say, I, whatever. And, and so really, that's a really good lesson. Like, it's not about me. It might be something that I want to help with, something I want to do, something I want to achieve, but I don't know how to do that thing. So yeah. I know I went way left field, but <laughs> no, that was great. Look, we go across the whole field here, right? Like whatever comes up, I feel like someone somewhere needed it. So, you yes. know, I love that. Right. And I heard in the beginning strategic partnerships, but I do feel like the, it's not about you. Right. Cause you can mm -hmm. get puffed up. I remember when I mm -hmm. realized it wasn't about me and it was sad. I had to mourn for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great reality because it allows you to show up as a better person, right? And look mm -hmm. at 
look at different things as opposed to just looking at, you know, looking from one angle, right? I feel like it also helps you get your life back because Mm -hmm. when you try to make things about you, then you have so much to prove, you know, and then you have to work that much harder and put that much time into something that when you would have re if you would have just said, you know what, I need other people because a lot, a lot of times we're, we're too busy trying to prove that we don't need help. We don't need other people. We can do it all by ourselves. It only costs you more time, more energy, more stress when you do that. So I think uh, for me, just saying, you know what? Okay. I'm going to let somebody else come in here and help. I'm terrible about asking for help, but letting people help me, I can, I can do that. (laughs) Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in that, I'm in that boat too. The asking I'm learning slowly, but surely, right? Mm -hmm. The more we do it, the more we're getting better at it. Yes. All right. Okay. So tell us any advice that you would have for an up and coming entrepreneur. Hmm. Okay. Well, I always tell people to make sure that you do what you love to do, what your passion is and get really, you know, engaged. But I think that the best advice that I give or the best advice that I gave myself is just be authentic. Just be authentic about who you are as a person and how you engage with other people. One thing, you know, in our organization, we work with our staff and we say, you know, you don't need to be fake with these young people because they'll see right through you. And I feel like the same thing is true with entrepreneurship. You just need to be your best authentic self. And and I think that helps you to be more successful because nobody can be a better you than you, right? Mm. But trying to be somebody else and trying to impress people by, you know, using something else that you've seen, oftentimes you can't keep up with that because it's Mm -hmm. not really who you are. And so it's really important to just be authentic. And and also the other thing that I tell people is to be courageous. People are going to challenge you. People are going to get in your way, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. And you're going to have to be courageous and just let people know that you're coming to do this and, you know, let them know politely that you, first, <laughs> you know, that this is what we're doing. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be taking the helm, sometimes you have to be courageous because you're going to have to tell people things that they don't want to hear. You're going to have to do things that people don't want to see you do, Mm -hmm. but that's what it takes to be successful is to, you know, be courageous and be authentic and just push through. Okay. Thanks for that. I love it. All right. So before we finish, I like to ask what I call fun questions, right? I am a person that believes in travel and the importance of vacationing and taking breaks. So can you tell us where you went for your last vacation? Where is your favorite vacation place? And where's your next vacation or one that you aspire to be your next vacation? Okay. So my last vacation was in Puerto Vallarta. It was with myself, my husband, and the kids. This time we were smart. We got them their own villa. (laughs) Just so they didn't have to stay with us. We had an awesome time, took, you know, total advantage of all the resort things. My favorite vacation spot is Jamaica. I just had such a good time in Jamaica. I can just go there and just just get with the culture, with the people. I mean, when you go to Jamaica, they just really like, they just enjoy life. Mm-hmm. Their beaches are are clean. It's nothing like what we see on TV when you go, at least not the parts of Jamaica that I vacation in. <laughs> so, but you get to enjoy the culture, the people, the food. It's just so awesome. My dream vacation, the place that I've been trying to get is to Paris, to Paris. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm just like, gosh, man, you know, right now you can find some some good flights to places. So I I plan to get there. I plan to get there before I'm 50. That's the goal. (laughs) Okay, nice. I love it. I love it. All right. So before you go, do you want to tell us about any events, any offers or services where the listeners can find you? You know, what I offer to people is my offer is service and my offer is to uh, really be able to help people figure out how they can be more engaged in the community. So ransomforsupervisor.org, it's R-A-N-S-O-M for F-O-R supervisor.org. It's a place where you can contact me. I like to encourage people, if you're trying to figure out how you can get involved in the community, maybe you don't want to be an elected person, but you want to know like, how can I make decisions about parks and how can I make decisions about, you know, water and school issues and things like that? 
I'll be more than happy to lead people the way because I feel that someone did it for me. And it's important to teach people how to engage instead of criticizing them for not engaging. So if anybody's looking to get involved, do that. I just like to encourage people to go out there and find ways to be helpful. And I don't have anything other to offer than that because that's just, that's what we do around here. But thank you so much, you know, for having this conversation and being able to talk to people about how they can get engaged and involved and just, you know, make this place better. All right. So Rodisha, thank you so much. I appreciate you just coming on, sharing, being transparent and encouraging us to get involved, right? If we want to see a change, we have to be a change. Yes. So thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for everything that you are doing. I really appreciate how you are uplifting women and I appreciate being here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of When Hers United. I hope you found this information useful and can take at least one thing away to help you be and do better. Don't forget to follow When Hers United on Clubhouse so you can join in on the various conversations we have I would love to see you in the audience and invite you on the stage. As always, be empowered and empower on.